Hey, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be here with all of you. Uh, it's Friday night. I'm here in my lovely Brooklyn apartment, ready to have yet another amazing conversation with all of you. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Let's go. The American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the basket. We need a government of action. Welcome, 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 everybody. So glad to have you here with us tonight. Yeah, you know, we're just going to have a late night chat. Um, bring your friends, tweet this out, share it, post it around. We'll just have a late night conversation. A few quick announcements um, to get out of the way. Uh, first things first, uh, on Saturday, next Saturday, a week from tomorrow, uh, there will be a new documentary. Uh, Peter Coffin is very skilled at what he does. Very funny man. Uh, he's a comedian. He's got comedy experience, but he's also a great editor and filmmaker. And he has made this 45 to 50 minute documentary uh, about the Center for Political Innovations conference that we just did, the Summit Against Hypocrisy. And it's going to premiere on the CPI YouTube channel. So go and subscribe to the CPI YouTube channel. Go and subscribe. Uh, and next Saturday, we'll have a premiere up soon. Don't worry. Next Saturday, a full documentary featuring many of the beloved people who are in the chat right now. Many beloved people that are in the chat right now. Um, you know, uh, those folks are going to be uh, going to be featured in it. You're going to see a behind the scenes look at how we do our conferences so, um, you know, I would recommend that you go and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell, but also subscribe to the CPI YouTube channel, uh, because that is where this documentary, 47 to 50 minute documentary featuring so many great people. I could start naming people and then I would leave somebody out. Everyone who was at our conference is in the documentary. We talk about the significance of Cinco de Mayo to the fight against the Confederacy. Well, honestly, John, I don't know about that. So I don't think I can. I can talk about Cinco de Mayo. I would have to Google that. I don't know my Mexican history well enough, John. John, you stumped me. I, I am not, uh, that is not in my area of expertise, but there you go. So that's the first thing I just wanted to get out of the way. And thank you, John, for the super chat question. Wrote it down. I got plenty to say about Cinco de Mayo and stuff like that, who was born, et cetera. Thoughts, comments regarding the latest statements by Bergrazin criticizing Russian military leadership. And um, there you go. Um, so, you know, uh, that's the first thing. Uh, go subscribe to the CPI YouTube channel because that's where uh, Peter Coffin's great documentary about the Center for Political Innovation and our amazing conference, that's where it's going to air. So go subscribe to the CPI's YouTube channel. Couple other quick things. Uh, Patreon community, I have not forgotten you. I have not forgotten you, lovely members of the Patreon community. As you can tell, May 1st, I was a little bit busy running to different protests and rallies across New York City. Um, but Patreon community, you have not been forgotten. We will be having a patrons only stream very soon. So go, if you want to be in on it, you've still got time. Usually I do them on the first of the month, but since we're a little bit behind this month, uh, by all means, now is the time to go and be part of the Patreon community, um, you know, and you can be on in on that patrons only stream. 
Uh, so there you go. Patreon community, you are not forgotten. Uh, there we go. Um, couple other quick announcements. Um, I don't know if people are aware, but those of you that are CPI members, we're going to be having a great workshop tomorrow night about how to politically engage with people. Reminder to CPI members, I just was in a meeting, a pre-meeting with Peter Coffin and President Elizabeth Young, our CPI president, about that workshop and with our special guest, and it should be very informative. Uh, so if you're a CPI member, you know, by all means, come to that workshop. It's an online workshop. It's going to be great. Uh, the Huru movement is trying to raise money for their defense. Uh, so that's listed down below and, and in the chat and listed down below. We got to do everything we can to support the Uhuru movement as they face these criminal charges. Yeah, a lot of things are going on. If you want to become a member of the Center for Political Innovation and be involved in great struggles like the struggle to drop the charges against the Uhuru movement or the, the education and edu educating people about socialism and anti-imperialism, you want to be part of our vibrant community, uh, you can join the Center for Political Innovation. People are joining all the time. We get new memberships flowing in all the time. We're having great workshops. We're going to have an event for members only and not a public event, a private event coming up at the end of June. So in order to be part of that, if you want to be part of that, um, by all means, you're going to have to join uh, because it won't be a public event, but it's going to be very exciting. Um, that'll be in June. We're looking to have a conference in the next couple of months, probably out on the West Coast. A lot of good things are happening with the Center for Political Innovation. A lot of good stuff. So yeah, those are the announcements. I just wanted to get out there, you know, uh, just get them out there while we're we're talking. Uh, so hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Um, and so for those of you who may not be familiar, the way we do things on this program uh, is that I give my opening remarks and my opening remarks are then followed by a roll call where we find out who it is on the other side of the camera who's watching, who is at home or out walking the streets, watching this. And then after that, after the roll call and after the opening remarks, then I answer super chat questions for the rest of the night. So if there's something you want me to talk about, two people have already sent in questions. If there is something you'd like me to talk about in the second half of our program, all you have to do is send me a super chat. I will put it on the screen and type it down and then I will answer your super chat question. Hopefully in the second half of the show, you know, the overwhelming majority of super chats I can answer. Now, every so often, every so often there's a super chat I just can't answer. It's too obscene or something like that. And that happens. Um, but within reason, I will do my best to give you an answer. Um, you know, if I don't know, I just don't know. I'm going to comment on John's thing, but I actually can't. You know, it's not a it's not a not something I can just rattle off the top of my head. You know, I don't always know the answer to every super chat, but there you go. Epoch Times has one foot in the pro-Russia camp. How can they support Trump after Russia banned Fallen Gong? Okay. Um, so there you go. Very good question. Very, very good question. Um, you know, and that's how it works in the second half of our show. I'll be answering your super chats. So I thought I might get into our opening remarks for tonight. Um, because I want to talk about a few things. Um, you know, there are recurring themes on these broadcasts. Um, you know, the title of my new book, where is America going? Marxism, MAGA, and the coming revolution. The reason I wrote this book is because American politics is changing very rapidly and getting weirder and more confusing by the day. And I think that's a reality we can all acknowledge. But the weirdness of American politics creates an opening for those of us who are sincere and those of us who genuinely want to help the country 
creates an opening for us to effectively intervene. And get things done. However, this requires us to acknowledge how strange things are getting. This requires us to admit that everything we know is wrong, or not so much wrong, everything we know is outdated. Weird Al Yankovic in the 1980s had a song, Everything You Know Is Wrong. Well, it's not that everything you know is wrong, it's just outdated. So we're going to talk about American politics and how it has developed over the course of really since the Second World War. We're going to do a quick summary. But I'm going to hit it from a different angle than I've always hit it because we have to understand politics and how strange it is and how we have an opportunity to intervene, etc. So... World War II happened. The birth of modern America, the birth of what they called the American century, happened with the Second World War. And the Second World War was a definitive moment in American politics because it was the end of the Great Depression. It was also the end of British dominance. It was the moment where U.S. imperialism became the dominant force in the world economically and militarily. And coming out of the Second World War, there were a set of things that you were supposed to believe as an American. And if you did not believe these things, you were weird. You were on the fringe of politics. Coming out of World War II, some people talk about how the U.S. military in World War II was almost the first brainwashing operation, right? It was millions and millions. I mean, every young man was drafted to go and fight in World War II, to fight against the Nazis. Every young man went through military basic training um, and fought. I think about my grandfather was from a small town in Missouri. He, he went and joined the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, um, he, you know, he ended up in the U.S. Marine Corps and he had a high uh, score on an intelligence test. And so they made him a U.S. Navy officer. Um, he was in the Pacific. Think about my other grandfather. He was from a small town in Ohio, a farm boy. He went into the U.S. Army Air Corps, which was a precursor to the Air Force. There was no Air Force at that time. Think about World War II as like a full mobilization of the country. Every young man, with very few exceptions, went into the military. And all the women were mobilized in the war effort. You know, my one grandmother became a nurse. She was a nurse. Another, My other grandmother worked in an armaments factory and made bullets in St. Louis, Missouri. You know, and it was just this whole mobilization of the country. Centralization of the economy in a lot of ways for war production. Set prices, set wages, rationing. World War II was just like a whole mobilization of the country. The country had been in the Great Depression. And then in response to the bombing of Pearl Harbor and rivalry with the German and Italian imperialists and and all kinds of factors, World War II happened. Coming out of World War II, every American pretty much, when they talk about the nuclear family, right? The term nuclear family, that comes from the Cold War, right? That, you know, at the end of World War II, they dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then you had the baby boom, right? As they had, the atomic bombs had been dropped, the American century had begun, and all these people started coming home from World War II, getting married and having children. The baby boom had begun. And that sacred American nuclear family that came into existence, that mom and dad and 2.5 children, uh, there were certain things coming out of World War II that every American was expected to believe. Number one, 
was that America was the greatest country in the world because we had freedom and liberty and we were the greatest. We were amazing. We had a special American way of life and the Constitution and the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. And, and that was just part of what everyone believed. America was amazing. America was number one. America was ultra patriotic. And what's weird is, you know, some of that came from the, the military. A lot of it mostly came from the war mobilization. Some of that came from the popular front of the Communist Party and Earl Browder, right? The Communist Party became ultra patriotic during the Popular Front period. And some of that came from, you know, you know, the fascism in the United States uh, that had existed prior to the Second World War. But regardless, going into the Second World War, coming out of the Second World War, pretty much everyone in the country was just embedded, like doused in this patriotism, this ultra patriotism. And, you know, even when I was a kid, I mean, I'm only 35 years old, but when I was a kid, it was still there, especially after 9-11. It was just, there was this ultra patriotism. America is special. America is number one. America is, is, you know, exceptional American exceptionalism. There's something magical about the constitution and the flag. And, and this, this was just something that everyone in America was expected to believe in. If you did not believe it, you were on the margins. A lot of black people didn't believe it. Black nationalism was a big trend. Uh, and there was a wave of lynchings after World War II, uh, horrendous lynchings uh, that happened of, of black soldiers simply for wearing their uniforms. Uh, white people didn't appreciate seeing black soldiers be proud of their military service. So there were a number of black men that were lynched just for wearing their military uniforms. A lot of people in the black community didn't feel this ultra patriotism. Um, you know, and there were some religious groups that didn't, right? You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they were not allowed by their religion to participate in the military. And so they basically worked in these, been put in prison camps during World War II. They were put in these conscientious objector camps and they didn't salute the flag. And, you know, similar for Quakers, Quakers also, they couldn't fight in the war. And so they were put in these kind of prison labor camps during the war. And, you know, I'm sure the Japanese who were interned, they obviously didn't feel that way. But if you weren't ultra patriotic coming out of world war ii something was off right that was just that was considered the mainstream view and it was a very very big chunk of the u.s population the second thing you were expected to believe in coming out of world war ii which was standard again not saying this is right this is just how it was was christianity right you could be a catholic or a protestant but you Christianity was considered to be the norm. That was just because the bulk of the country was of religious heritage. The country was religious, more or less, you know, and so there were Catholics, there were Protestants. And if you were Jewish and if you were Muslim, Islam was almost unheard of in the United States at that time. If you were an atheist, as the communists were, the Communist Party were, if you were interested in Eastern religions, that was all just, you were on the fringe. You were not ultra patriotic and you were not a Christian. You were on the fringe, right? That was just something that you were, you were expected to believe in, right? We talk about the nuclear family. We talk about coming out of World War II, the baby boom. The bulk of the country were ultra patriotic, including the communists even. The bulk of the country were Christian. You obviously have people that weren't, you know, um, and then Starting during World War II, and this is very interesting. This is actually a good thing. The other two, not so good. The other two can be quite intolerant and chauvinistic, but the, the third one is actually kind of a good thing. Coming out of World War II, for the first time in American history, this is very, very interesting, and people don't want to acknowledge this, but you know, there's a book I read by a fascist, and he complained about this. He was bemoaning this, but it was this is a good thing. Coming out of World War II, for the first time in American history, you were expected not only to be ultra patriotic, not only to be Christian, but also to be thinking that racism was a bad thing. Now, it didn't mean you weren't bigoted. Most white Americans held bigotry. I mean, that doesn't mean you didn't hold, harbor any racial stereotypes. That doesn't mean there wasn't a huge amount of inequality, which there was. And Jim Crow segregation still existed in the South. But starting at the end of World War II, if one watched mainstream American media, if one listened to the speeches that came from the presidents and elected officials in Washington, D.C., there was a notion that 
ethnic or racial bigotry was a bad thing. That racism, race prejudice is how they used to put it, was a bad thing. And that was new. That had not been part of the American consciousness. It certainly wasn't the feeling in the South. In the Jim Crow South, they didn't feel that way. But coming out of World War II, there was a feeling that in America, we're ultra patriotic. In America, we are Christian. And in America, we think racial and ethnic bigotry are a bad thing. A kind of a bland statement, right? During World War II, there was a big effort by the Communist Party and by the NAACP and a lot of people to point out that the Nazis were racist, which they were. They were. And to point out that America was fighting against the Nazis and that America was a, a melting pot, they used to say. America is a melting pot of, of different, different ethnicities. And so there started to be this notion that, that the American identity was ultra patriotic and this belief that we in America are special because of our freedom and our hard work and our innovation and blah, 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 blah. And that we in America are Christian, you know, we might be Catholic, we might be Protestant, but we're, we're Christian. And on top of that, that in America, we don't hold anyone's race or ethnic background against them. In America, we judge people by the contents of their character. Coming out of World War II, that was the normal. And if you were not part of that normal, you were weird. And the first group that got targeted for being outside of that normal was the Communist Party. The Communist Party of the United States, which had a huge amount of influence in New York City. You have no idea how deep their roots were in New York City. During, during the Second World War, two city council seats in New York City, not one, but two of the city council seats were held by members of the Communist Party. Benjamin Davis and Peter Cushoning were elected, they were members of the New York City Council, and they were both card-carrying members of the Communist Party. And the House of Representatives in Harlem, they elected Vito Marcantonio, who was also a communist, who was a, wasn't a Communist Party member. He was considered a fellow traveler. He was part of the, he had the American Labor Party, but he was pro-Stalin and pro-Moscow, and he was, you know, he was considered to be a communist. And you know, there were communist summer camps, there were communist baseball leagues in New York City, in San Francisco, in Chicago, in a lot of urban areas. There was a wing of the Democratic Party that was around the Communist Party USA. Now, the Communist Party, to be a member of the Communist Party, meant you had to give the whole of your life. You had to give like a large percentage of your income. You had to do party work all the time. You weren't allowed to publicly say anything that went against the party line. You had to maintain democratic centralism, meaning that, that you said exactly the same thing as every other party member. It was very demanding to be a member of the party. So very few people actually joined the party. But the milieu of people that were around the Communist Party was massive. You know, not everyone who went to a Communist Party summer camp was in the Communist Party. Maybe the two people the two directors of the summer camp might be party members, but the rest, it would just be, you know, a socialist summer camp that was kind of directed by the Communist Party. You know, not everyone in the baseball league in Brooklyn that was run by the Communist Party would be in the Communist Party. Maybe one or two people that ran it would be, but the rest would be, you know, not the way it was. You know, there were a lot of labor unions. There were community associations. There were anti-fascist associations. There were writers clubs. There were musicians you know, groups of people who played music together and put on con uh, concerts. And, I mean, it was all kinds of stuff. You have no idea. You have no idea how, um, you know, how massive, you know, um, the Communist Party was uh, during those days. And the Communist Party was, was one political current that was atheistic. They did not believe in God. Uh, they did. They were ultra patriotic, though. They did believe communism was 20th century Americanism. They had Jefferson bookstores named after Thomas Jefferson. Their training school in New York City, where they trained activists from around the country, was called the Jefferson School. It had originally been called the Lenin School, and then they wanted to appear more American, so they made it the Jefferson School. And the Communist Party, in most urban areas, was a wing of the Democratic Party and a wing of the labor unions. So starting after World War II, we had this, this America was in resurgence. The Great Depression was over. The Great Depression was over. Uh, the, you know, the, the economy was booming again. The USA suddenly was riding high, defeated the Nazis, defeated the Japanese, 
Cold War was going, selling weapons to the whole world, and ultra-patriotic America, and ultra-Christian America, and newly anti-racist in a vague way America, not really, but at least this notion that that's what someone should be. The first group they went after was the Communist Party. And the Communist Party, they were public enemy number one, as far as anyone was concerned. They were not good people. The TV news every night did stories about how awful they were. Uh, they all lost their jobs. The National Board of the Communist Party got put in prison. The FBI followed them around. It became an illegal organization. Hundreds of members were thrown in jail. It was actively broken up. This group, of this wing of the Democratic Party that was centered around the Communist Party, this wing of the Roosevelt, the Roosevelt wing of the Democratic Party that was heavily influenced by the Communist Party was extinguished. It was stamped out. You weren't allowed to be that anymore. Those socialist summer camps, they couldn't exist. Those socialist choirs and marching bands, those socialist labor unions, they passed a law, the taft mccarran Act. No member of the Communist Party can be a, a elected to office in a labor union. You know, they, they went all out. They weren't, no one was gonna, gonna be a communist. That was just not, not how it was. Then, after that, as McCarthyism started to fade, then there started to be a feeling in the United States, um, you know, that among the Cold War liberals who thought McCarthyism had got out of control, who felt that McCarthyism was a threat to the power structure in a lot of ways, when the Rockefellers were being accused of being communists, when, you know, the Voice of America propaganda broadcasts were accused of being communists, when, when you know, a member of Congress committed suicide because Joe McCarthy found out his son was gay and blackmailed him over it. At that point, as McCarthyism started to die down, there was a fear on the part of the power structure that the race question in the United States, racism was a ticking time bomb, and that the Kennedy family and others started moving against Jim Crow segregation. And if you were an advocate of racism, you were considered to be fringe. Mainstream American television supported the civil rights movement. Mainstream American television felt that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a well-intentioned good guy and that those people in Mississippi, uh, those people in, in Alabama who were clinging to those Jim Crow laws that treated black people as second-class citizens, they were, they were not good folks. They were on the fringes. And so you started to see people that were openly racist, people that were openly white supremacist, they got pushed into the margins too, right? And that became less and less an acceptable view in the United States, right? That coming out of World War II, you had this normal, you had this thing everyone believed. And then as the 1960s got going, you had the new left, the protests against the Vietnam War, the, the civil rights movement eventually turning into the Black Liberation Movement. And then... 1970s, you have Richard Nixon, and eventually you get Ronald Reagan. And the way American politics was basically set up from the end of World War II, after McCarthyism, and then after the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, the way American politics was set up was like this. There was this thing, there were these things that Americans were just expected to believe. American exceptionalism, Patriot, ultra patriotism, America's magic, America's special, America's, you know, you know, I'm an advocate of patriotism, but not this stuff. This stuff is just silly. This stuff is just idiotic, right? There was that stuff. And there was the Christianity. The Christianity was just generally accepted. If you were not Christian, that was, you were a pretty big exception. And there was this vague feeling that one should not be racist. Again, a lot of people were racist. A lot of inequality existed. You know, plenty of racism everywhere, but there was this vague notion that one, that being racist was bad, you know, was a bad thing to do. That became kind of the American ideology. And everyone believed it, more or less, right? Again, many in the black community weren't into the ultra-patriotism. And there were some, you know, 
staunch racists and there were, you know, there were different religious groups. And starting in the 1960s, you had a wave of secularism, you had more open atheism, you had more interest in Eastern mysticism and different religious ideas coming from the East. But for the most part, you know, and this goes even up into the 90s, America was like this. It was like this when I was a kid, right? It, this was just how U.S. society was. And there was a far left and the far left were the people, were one group of people who were at odds with this. And they were often atheists, not always. They were often usually opposed to the ultra patriotism, usually opposed to US wars, and opposed to capitalism. And the far left, the communists, the, the communists, the anarchists, the socialists, that crowd of people who went to anti war protests. Uh, you know, who read Noam Chomsky books. There was a fringe that was often around big colleges and universities that had little bookstores they hung out at, that had little newspapers that they read, that liked to protest things. There was this fringe of people that were far left dissidents. And they just existed. And at the same time that this was the way America was, there was also a far right fringe, right? You had open racists. You had open racists, people that were just openly racist. You had white supremacists, Ku Klux Klan kind of people, you know, neo-Nazi kind of people. You, you had those kind of people, right? And you had the John Birch Society, you had people who thought that, you know, that the Democrats were all a bunch of communist agents. The Republicans were communist agents. You had militia kind of people that that were convinced the government was going to take our guns away. And, you know, were you know, forming rifle clubs with their friends. And, you know, we're talking about the Illuminati and the Jewish conspiracy against the white race and blah, 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 stuff like that. You had far right fringe. You had far left fringe. And most people just kind of accepted, you know, this standard American line, which was those three things I just listed, which are all pretty meaningless if you really think about it. What does it mean to be ultra patriotic? What does that mean? I, I mean, just you like America. America is just special. It's just amazing. It's just number one. It's just, it's a meaningless thing. The Christianity too. What does that mean? Anyone can say they're a Christian, right? Anyone. I, I, you, you like Jesus? I like Jesus. Oh, I'm a Christian. Aren't you a Christian? I, anyone can say they're a Christian. And anyone can say they're anti-racist, right? Anyone can say that, right? Are you against racism? Of course. I don't, I'm not a racist. Racists are bad people. I'm not bad. You know, it, none of those three things even mean anything, okay? But they were just these three vague ideas that were considered to be the mainstream of American politics. And that if you wanted to be accepted into mainstream American politics, you had to some degree or other voice support for these three things. Many, most Americans said they would not vote for a politician who was not a Christian. Most Americans said they would not vote for a politician who was openly racist. And most Americans said they would not vote for a politician who was anti-American, whatever that meant. And so the bulk of American politics, we're talking about like 80% of Americans were of the opinion, would describe themselves as patriotic Americans who love their country, who are Christian and who are anti against racism because racism is bad. You know, that was just the ruling party line in America. And it's very weird. It's very, very, very weird. Um, it's very, very strange. But that was the party line. I remember as clear as day when that was the party line. And I... You know, everyone I knew, I mean, it was Republicans were like this. Democrats were like this. You know, Democrats leaned slightly closer to the communists, but not necessarily. Communists were still a completely different thing. Republicans leaned slightly closer to the far right, but not necessarily. The far right was still a completely different thing. And there was just this way American politics was. It was crafted together during, during the Second World War. Uh, and McCarthyism solidified it against the left and the civil rights movement solidified it against the far right. And there was just this, this was the party line in America. And anyone who thought outside the box of those three things 
was to some degree or other a weirdo. You had to be really into politics to think outside the box. You had libertarians, right? But libertarian was like a fringe thing, right? Is someone's a libertarian? What does that mean? Most people didn't even know what it meant, right? Is that the same as a liberal? Is a libertine? Is this like, a, you know, people didn't know what it meant, right? Um, and that everyone who was outside of this, you had to almost be like really smart to not be in this category of people. You had to be really interested in politics. Most people got their politics from television and television was almost always in this box. And that's the way American politics was. American politics is not like this anymore. For those of you who may be aware, which I'm sure everyone watching this stream is aware, American politics is not like this by any means. We are in a completely different ballpark nowadays. This is not what American politics is like. Donald Trump does not fit into this category. Donald Trump, his slogan is make America great again. Again. No politician would have dared say that during the Cold War years. Are you saying America's not already great? It stopped being great? That would have been, that would have been blasphemy. In the 90s, if Bill Clinton had said, let's make America great again, everyone would have <gasps> everyone would have jumped. What do you mean? America's not great. Right? And then Joe Biden talking about systemic racism. There's no racism in America. We don't do that. We stopped doing that. We're, you know, I mean, I, everything is completely out of whack. Everything in American politics is completely out of whack right now. But it's not out of whack because that way things used to be, that's not permanent. No politics is ever permanent. Let me repeat this. No politics is ever permanent. Political discourse, political framework, political setup, none of this is permanent. There's no permanent political system. Capitalism as an economic system has only been around for like 500 years. Before that, there was, there was feudalism. Before that, there was slavery. For that was hunter-gatherer civilization, right? The American government, the American constitution is only about 200, a little over 200 years old, right? 1776, the Declaration of Independence. Like there is no permanent in politics. And part of the reason people get stuck, part of the reason people get stuck and confused politically is that they have it in their head, well, there's, the left, and there's the right. No, there's not. No, there's not. There was at one time, if you were talking about the left and the right in the 1980s, the 1990s, even in the early 2000s, you had, there was some logic to it. You knew your way around. There was the far right fringe, the militia people, the John Birch Society, the Ku Klux Klan, they were over here. There were the communist groups and the anarchist groups, and they were over here. And the Democrats were over here. And, were, and, and if you were talking about the left and the right, you knew your way around. It's not like that anymore. We are in a new political ballpark where you don't really know your way around. Things don't make any sense. Things are very, very confusing. Things are very, very confusing. And saying that is not heresy because the way things used to be was not set in stone. Nothing is ever set in stone. Let me emphasize, nothing is ever set in stone. Nothing is permanent in the universe. A does not equal A. I told that to you all a million times. A does not equal A. And just because that's the way things were post-World War II, it's not the way things are permanently. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, things are completely different and it's okay that they're different, but the fact that they're different means that we have to figure out, we have to figure out 
and what we're doing. And we have to get our bearings. We have to get our bearings. We have to make sense of this. We have to make sense of this because it doesn't make sense anymore. And if you think that this is permanent, oh, the Caleb, the, and this is what people do. They project. They say, well, well, Caleb, there's always been a right wing. There's always been a left wing. Yeah, there have always, since the French Revolution, there have been people who describe themselves as left. There have been opponents of those people who I guess you could describe as right. But what it meant to be one of those people has been changed drastically. For example, a big part of what it meant post-World War II to be a conservative was that you believed in capitalism, right? Post-World War II, the communists became the enemy, and America and the American way of life and the right wing became associated with the free market system and capitalism. And all right wing literature made that argument. Right. Uh, there was an extreme far right guy, uh, a white supremacist. Um, what was his name? Oh, boy. What was his name? I can't even remember his name. He was the former governor of Louisiana who became um, became a far right wing extremist. He had the Christian nationalist movement. He called himself. Well, he believed in crazy free market capitalism. Can't remember his name. Can't remember his name. It's escaping me. Um, that guy. Right. The, the American Nazi Party. If you listen to the American Nazi Party, they believed in free market capitalism. Everybody on the far right, the John Birch Society, they all believed in American free market capitalism. Um, that was what they believed in, right? Um, um, Gerald L.K. Smith, right? He was a, a, a guy who'd been a governor of Louisiana, and then he started a far right wing anti-Semitic movement after World War II. And, you know, he, he called himself, he called himself a Christian nationalist. But if you listen to anything he said, it was all about free market American capitalism and the communists. Gerald L.K. Smith. David Duke was not until the 80s. You guys, David Duke was not until the 80s. That, that's decades later. I'm talking about Gerald L.K. Smith, uh, George Lincoln Rockwell, the American Nazi Party, the John Birch Society. All of them, as far as they were all concerned, American capitalism was the way. However, if you go back before World War II, it wasn't like that. Before World War II, criticizing American capitalism was not exclusively left-wing. Now, the Ku Klux Klan had been the main far-right group in the country. The, the height of Ku Klux Klan membership was in the 20s. And the Ku Klux Klan back in the 1920s, and for most of its existence, they were advocates of the free market capitalism. But especially starting in the mid-1930s, you had a lot of fascists in America, like people who called themselves fascists. Uh, you had the Silver Legion of America, led by William Dudley Pelley. And William Dudley Pelley denounced capitalism all the time. He called for an American Christian commonwealth, and he was against communism. He hated communists, uh, but he advocated his own form of weird you know, national socialism, traditionalist, conservative, whatever. It was called the Christian Commonwealth, right? You had Father Coughlin, Father Charles Coughlin, who was the radio priest. He was from Michigan. And he was a priest who liked and admired Adolf Hitler and was really anti-communist. But all of his broadcasts, if you listen to the broadcasts that he made in the 1930s, Father Coughlin, this far-right extremist, he, everything he said always was condemning capitalism. He would condemn capitalism as the system that goes against God. You know, he had this like Irish priest accent and you listen to him, God, and capitalism is against God. You know, I mean, he just, you know, it was this weird, I don't know. Anyway, you know, that's like the Father Coughlin accent. When you listen to Father Coughlin, you're listening to like the old, there used to be this American Irish brogue, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, like, you know, the, the cops of New York City. It used to be, if you go back, you watch old movies from like the 1940s. The police officer talks like this. It's not a full Irish accent, right? It's like an, an American Irish accent. That's how Father Coughlin preached, right? And he 
talked of capitalism and the children of God. And it's it's not a full Irish brogue. It's like it's like a half brogue, something like that. Right. And that was standard on the American far right. And in fact, Ayn Rand, uh, who was the big far right demagogue, a big, you know, she wrote Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. You know, before World War II, she was condemning capitalism. She put up posters, you know, she called herself an American fifth columnist in honor of the fifth column in Spain and the pro-fascist sentiments. And, you know, she she condemned capitalism as a as a system that she was against. Ayn Rand was against capitalism before World War II. And then after World War II, she and the rest of the far right decided capitalism was the way to go. Um, right. Interesting question. Um, you know, um, that used to be it used to be acceptable for people on the right to condemn capitalism, right? But they would condemn it in a right wing way. They would condemn it because it was getting away from good morals. It was not loyal to the nation. That used to be acceptable. Now, even now, I mean, it's very rare on the right you will find anyone who criticizes capitalism. Now. Tucker Carlson made a little bit of noise like that. And you have some people like that are fringe on the far right, you know, trad Catholics and others that will start to talk that way. But it's extremely rare, right? It's extremely rare. But it, the fact that that's even back shows that how politics is changing. Um, the other thing that, that used to be the case, and I, I remember this very vividly, is that atheism was explicitly and almost exclusively left wing. If someone did not believe in God, that was considered to be a left-wing sentiment, right? If you didn't believe in God, you were a leftist, right? If you were an atheist, you were considered to be on the left. Um, that was just standard, right? If you didn't believe in God, people assumed you must be a communist, you must be a socialist. Um, you know, you certainly weren't a Republican if you didn't believe in God. You must be a Democrat for sure, and even most of the Democrats would denounce you, Right. Um, that if you were an atheist, it was considered that you must be far left wing. Um, that's not the case any longer. It's certainly not the case any longer, right? It, uh, nowadays, in fact, a lot of atheists are very, very, quote unquote, right wing, whatever that means, in that they advocate free market economics. They're libertarians. Uh, a lot of atheists are advocates of racial supremacism and eugenics and racial pseudoscience. And, you know, there's all kinds of right-wing atheists nowadays, right? That did not used to be the case. Another example of how weird things have gotten. Another thing, criticism of big pharma. And this is really interesting. Criticism of big pharma, uh, you know, belief that vaccinations, you know, were not good, uh, you know, you know, natural medicines, all of that used to be considered left-wing. That was Dennis Kucinich. That was the hippies. That was, you know, that was naturopathic medicine and natural cures. And that was, that was hippies. That was left wing, right? And they would tell you about big pharma and the government and the corporations they didn't trust. And that was leftists, right? Not getting vaccinated and not taking regular medicine and taking herbs, herbal remedies and natural cures. And that was all considered left wing. Now that's considered right wing. You know, that's Alex Jones territory now. Anti-vaxxers are on the list of things, you're, people you're supposed to hate if you're a leftist, right? But that used to be a leftist thing. That used to be completely a leftist thing. Uh, Non-interventionism was largely a leftist thing. Now, to be fair, there were, like, here's here's a point I've often made. And I, and I made this point in an essay, and people don't appreciate this point, but it needs to be pointed out, right? Non-interventionism used to be an exclusively leftist thing. Exclusively, right? It, if you were protesting the wars, all the war protests, there were a lot of pacifists who might go to them, but they were led by communists. It was led by the far left. However, and this is what's pointed out, the far right wing, the John Birch Society, the militia movement, those kind of people, a lot of them, if you actually pressed them, were anti-war. But you would never know it because they spent all their time beating up anti-war protesters. This is true, right? 1960s, the first anti-war protests that they were having in 1965, 
the John Birch Society and those kind of people would beat up and attack leftists and they, they were mobilizing, you know, the anti-war movement as a communist conspiracy. But if you really pressed the John Birch Society and if you really pressed people that were associated with Father Coughlin or well, I guess there was no Father Coughlin then, but Gerald L.K. Smith or George Lincoln Rockwell, a lot of them actually did believe that the Vietnam War was not good. And they would say strange things like, well, the communists are advocating peace. So the government is setting up a war in order to make the communists look good. That was an argument that the John Birch Society used to make. And that makes no sense whatsoever. But, you know, it's like, well, the global communist movement, if we read communist publications, they all call for peace. So our government is waging lots of wars to try and prove the communists right so they can take over. That does not make any sense. That's some pretty cuckoo thinking. But that was the kind of thing they would say, and that, you know, the wars actually strengthen the communists, the wars are communist because it's global, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, if you actually pressed the far right, many of them, the more extreme right wingers, Nazis, Birchers, those kind of people, if you really pressed them, they, they would actually say they were against the wars. But them being against the wars was just a footnote, because what did they do? What was the function that they carried out? Their function was to go around harassing the left and go around attacking communists. And they were just shock troops against the left. The main opposition to the Vietnam War was coming from the left. The main opposition to the political structure of the United States was coming from the left. And the far right wing, a lot of them, if you really pressed them, you know, if you got into a situation where you might debate them or something like that, a lot of them would say they were against the war a lot of them would say, well, we should either nuke Vietnam or not be there. We, you know, that was an argument. You'd see them with the signs that say nuke Hanoi, and they'd say, we either drop an atomic bomb on, on Vietnam and win, or we just pull out. They would make statements like that. They didn't actually want the USA to continue fighting in Vietnam. But they were so wrapped up in the idea that the anti-Vietnam War movement was a communist conspiracy that what they actually believed about the war was just kind of a footnote because they were wrapped up in communists are bad, communists are leading the anti-war movement, so we got to stop the anti-war movement. And Gavin is getting to my point, and I made this point in an essay, modern leftists are basically that, right? Modern leftists, in a lot of cases, if you really press them, or if they know anything, which most of them don't, most of them are supposed to be against the American power structure. Most of them are supposed to be against these wars, U.S. interventions. Most of them are supposed to be against FBI and government repression. But you'd never know it because they're too caught up in pointing fingers at everyone and calling them fascist and saying everyone's a fascist, everyone's a Trump supporter, and they're too busy fighting the right wing for the establishment. You would never know they take these positions. The modern left basically plays the role of the John Birch Society. The John Birch Society claimed to be this radical movement that was against the American political establishment from the right, but their actual function was just to serve the American elite because all they did was go around harassing leftists. And that's what modern leftists do. That's what the Answer Coalition does. That's what, you know, the that's what, you know, DSA. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, sure, they might be against American wars. Sure, they might be against the American power structure. But the main thing that they go around doing is harassing the right wing, who is a threat to those things. So that's that's an important point to make. Uh, and that's part of how American politics is getting weird. It's part of how American politics is getting weird. This is a long kind of convoluted thing here, but I'm trying to get you to understand that if anyone comes up to you, and people do, and tries to tell you this is right wing, this is left wing, oh, you can't say that, this is right wing, this is left wing, you say, why? How? Who says? That's what you should say. Because things have gotten so goddamn weird now. There is no left wing, there is no right wing. There's no up. There's no down. We're in a completely new ballpark. We're in a completely new ballpark. And so if anyone comes to you and says, oh, that sounds like the right wing, say why? Who? What right wing? You're talking about the post-World War II white right wing? You're talking about Republicans? You're talking about Nazis? You're talking about, you're talking about militia members? Like, what, what is the right wing? What does right wing mean? First time, any, if anyone tells you that sounds right wing, you should immediately be asking them, what does right wing mean? And if someone says, well, that's a left wing thing, first thing out of your mouth should be, what does left wing mean? That should be the first thing out of your mouth. What does left wing mean? Because none of those terms have any meaning anymore. 
You have to make people define these terms. Because left and right have just become kind of thought-stopping tools. If you're in an area where everyone's supposed to be left-wing, the way you silence somebody is you say, you sound like the right wing. Usually, that person will go, no, I'm not right wing. You don't have to do that. Just ask, what does right wing mean? What does right wing mean? And see how weird it's going to get. Or do the opposite, right? Somebody's, you know, saying something and you're in an area and someone says, that sounds like communist. That sounds left wing. You say, why? Who said, what does left wing, what is communist, what does this mean? Get people to argue about concepts. Because you can't argue about geography if the compass is broken. Stop arguing with people about political geography. Because at the end of the day, it does not matter. If the sun is up, it's daytime. It doesn't matter if daytime, left wing or right wing, it's still daytime. If gravity exists, gravity exists. Doesn't matter if gravity's left wing or right wing. Doesn't matter. Does it exist or not? Right? And and you have to just change the direction of the conversation. Whenever the conversation is framed around this is right wing, this is left wing, you, we've already lost. You might think, well, I'm winning. I'm getting good points. I'm getting them to listen to me. No, you're not, because they're not thinking. When people start talking about that's left wing or that's right wing, they're not thinking. The way our country is set up at this point, for the most part, the way people think about politics, the way people have been programmed to think about politics, there are good people and there are bad people. Bad people are one way. Good people are another way. And that's all people think. Is that you know, if you're in a if you're a left wing, if you're someone who identifies with Biden and thinks Donald Trump is a fascist, you think left wing good, right wing bad. But what do either of those things mean? And if you're a Trump supporter, you think right wing good, left wing bad. What do what do either of those things mean? Right? And that that if you want to get people to think about politics. And really, I guess I'm telling you this because this is this this rant is all inspired by the conversation that happened earlier tonight when I was meeting with Peter Coffin and President Elizabeth Young and our special guest. I was thinking about if you want people to listen to you, this is very important. If you want people to listen to you, you have to show them that you are offering something unique. You have to show them that you are offering them something they won't get everywhere else. You have to engage them. You have to throw curveballs. You have to indicate that you have some kind of knowledge. Some kind of depth. That they won't find anywhere else. And that if you want to guarantee people don't listen to you when you're talking about politics, one surefire way to do that is sound like something they've already heard. If you sound like a Republican is supposed to sound like, if you sound like a Democrat is supposed to sound like, people won't listen to you. They will start listening to the caricature of a Republican or the caricature of a Democrat in their head, and they will stop listening to you. But if you say things that surprise people, 
and you don't come at them all at once, right? I mean, we're on YouTube now. I'm coming all at you because this is a show, right? This is entertaining. But make them ask you questions. Ask them questions. Like, what does left wing mean? What does right wing mean? Play the Socratic game with them a little bit and then make them ask you questions. Make them want more from you. Make them think this guy is making me think about politics in a way I have never thought about it before. Wow, he just asked me what left wing means. I've never really thought about what left wing means. What does this guy believe? And just give them a little bit. But make it about them. Make it about helping them to discover what they truly believe. Make it almost like it's, it's not about you preaching your ideology at them. You're helping them to understand what they already believe deep down. And you're helping them to think about it with a level of depth and from an angle they've never thought about it before. And make them come to you. Make them ask you questions. Make them think you're helping them figure themselves out. Ask them about their life experiences. Why? Why do they feel this way? Sounds to me, Bob, that you have a really strong feeling that Donald Trump is not a good guy. Why do you feel that way? What makes you different from the people who like Donald Trump? And let, let Bob just talk and let Bob start to explore in his own mind. Yes, why is it that I have a, such a strong objection to Trump? And what makes those people who like Trump different? Don't let Bob just hate him. Don't let Bob just... No, Bob, why do you... What makes you different than people that like Donald Trump? Why? And is it life experience that you have? Are there certain values that you have that make you different than people that like Trump? If you had grown up in another area, would you like Trump or wouldn't you? Just ask him questions and make his mind work. Make Bob's mind work. Make Bob think about himself in ways that he's never thought about himself before. Make Bob ask himself questions about his own beliefs that he has never asked himself before. Make Bob start to think about himself in relation to politics with a level of self-awareness that he's never had before. And if you can do that, Bob is going to really like you. Bob is going to think that you, you can do, you, you got me thinking. And then you can tell Bob, well, I'm part of something called the Center for Political Innovation. And we have certain perspective. We have a certain program, but we try to get people thinking outside the box. We want to save the country. We want the country. We want life in America to get better. We're having an event this weekend. You really ought to come. And that's my advice to you. That's my advice to you on how to talk to people about politics. That's my advice. Because the main thing is that if you want to actually talk to somebody, you want to actually talk to somebody, you have to psychologically unfreeze them. Most people are just going through the motions. You think about it, most people don't, think about what they say politically. They're in an area where everyone else says the same thing. 
They don't think about what they say. Donald Trump's an asshole. That's right. Donald Trump's an asshole. All right. You know, I, I'm, I'm voting for Biden. I'm voting for Biden. I'm voting for Donald Trump. He's a good guy. I'm voting for Donald. Most people, you know, you don't think when you get up in the morning and you walk into the bathroom, are you thinking left foot in front of right foot, left foot and run right foot, turn on light switch, get toothbrush? No, you just do it. You're not thinking about it. That's how most people are with politics. So the struggle, the struggle with those of us who are trying to get people to be aware, aware of the realities of the world, and also aware of their own ability to influence things, what we're doing is we're jerking them awake. We're forcing them to not just go, you know, when you wake up in the morning, left foot in front of right foot, left foot in front. You're not thinking. You just do it. You're just kind of going through the motions. And what we are doing, the process of what we are doing at the Center for Political Innovation is essentially getting people to engage with politics consciously. I am thinking about what I'm saying to you on these streams before I say it. That is what I am doing. You know, if someone is looking for a job, they're they're consciously thinking, I'm going to apply for this job. I'm going to, you know, you know, they're aware of what they're doing. But when it comes to politics, it comes to religion, most people do not think about it. Most people, to some degree or other, are just going through the motions. They're just going with the flow. And to be fair. You know, most people are going to do that, okay? And that's just a reality, okay? However, in times like the times we are living in now, in rare moments like this where civilizations are coming apart, where society is unable to function in the old way, a lot of people, a lot of people are suddenly more open to asking deep questions and getting deep answers. And that creates an opening for us. You know, nine out of 10 people might not be looking for anything. If you come along with something, they're just going to say, eh, not interested because they don't need anything. But there's, I would say, a solid one out of 10 people, maybe even two, three out of 10 people nowadays, especially people under the age of 30, especially people under the age of 40. A lot of people that are open at this point, that are asking tough questions, that that things don't make sense, they don't quite know what to believe, and they're not comfortable to just go, fuck Trump, or go Trump. And those people are who we need to talk to. And those people are who we need to talk to. We need to find a way to get people to be conscious about politics and to do so with our teachings and to do so with the guidance that we put forward. We want people to become conscious of their political role. That's what we want to do. And so that's just kind of my thoughts on it. I just thought that might be a great way to start the show tonight. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Names and locations, names and locations. I will call you all out as I see you. Names and locations, names and locations, names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Names and locations. Who's with us? Names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Who's with us tonight? Names and locations. Who is with us? Who's with us tonight? All righty. I'm just waiting for the names to start appearing. So there we go. I see John McCarthy in Chicago. I see St. David's Bermuda. John Whitty in Houston. Ben in Perth. Bendigo, Australia. Zach Bunch in Richmond, Virginia. Zach does amazing TikTok work. You guys should check out Zach on TikTok. It's utterly amazing the work he does there. Rice from Adelaide, Australia. Link your TikTok, Zach. I'll put it on the screen. We got Kieran from San Diego, Chester from England, Tyler from Missouri. Just started a podcast with Lori Spencer tonight. Uh, uh, Strange Bedfellows, David, Rennie, 
Hamilton, Ontario, Tony in Tasmania, Carlos in Anaheim, California, Clinton Frazier in South London, Alex from Brazil, Molly McGuire in Orange County, Carl in Washington. Christian from Jeffrey Bays, South Africa, Palo Alto, California, Heidi in Edinburgh, Scotland. We got Auckland, New Zealand, Bob Troy in New York, Anthony from Detroit, Mike from Oakland, Mariah, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. Blah. That's my groan for all the wicked people ruling. Blah. Is that a good enough groan? All right. Here's the TikTok of Zachary Bunch. Go and study that TikTok. Go and subscribe. He's doing great work on TikTok. Shout out to you, Zachary. Great work. LJ from Vancouver. Micah from Las Vegas. Auckland, New Zealand. Bob Troy in New York. Detroit, Anthony. Very, very, very good. Very, very, very good. We got Angelo, Angel U says, hello, you call this a revolution? Nope, I call it a YouTube stream. Uh, that's what I call it. That's what I call it. Um, Brodine in Funderbink, Cumming, Georgia. Brodine Funderbink, that's the name, in Cumming, Georgia. Welcome, Brodine. All right, Colin in Greensboro. Mariah is on TikTok. All right, all right. Names and locations, folks. Uh, we got Gleb is saying hello. Alan in Chicago is saying that he's Alan in Chicago. Pfft, semantics. Pfft, 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 pfft. Can you hear that in the microphone? Is that making a great noise? The pfft, 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 pfft. That was apparently Earl Browder's favorite microphone trick. I read this in a biography. He would make you anticipate his peas. Uh, he does that. I, actually, there's a recording of Earl Browder. Maybe we can play it on here, right? Earl Browder, the leader of the Communist Party USA during the 1930s. He was famous for, he was a very good orator. And unfortunately, because it was the 1930s, we don't have that many recordings of him. Uh, but there's one of them that we do have. And it was actually from the 1950s after he was kicked out of the Communist Party. Um, you know, he made an audio recording basically arguing that the Communist Party uh, you know, they should be allowed to, um, you know, they should, you know, be allowed to be part of the labor unions. And he does this oratory trick in his his speech. And apparently I, I heard it in the speech and then I read in a biography um, that apparently that was Earl Browder's trademark. It was his like trademark thing. He would make you anticipate the peas. So here we'll put Earl, we'll put, you know, Earl Browder on i i don't know if i'll play the whole speech i might find the part of the speech where he does it because it's it's amusing right i mean i guess it was a thing back in the days of early microphones maybe it was a bigger deal but it, it's kind of hilarious yeah it's an eight minute speech i'm not going to play the whole eight minute speech i'll find the time code right um i'll find the time code i'm going to put this speech on by earl browder and i will show you where he does this it is it is amusing um it is amusing um all right. Yeah, there we go. All right. Cool. So I'm just downloading the speech and we'll put it on. We'll listen to Earl Browder. Earl Browder was the leader of the Communist Party USA, and he basically didn't want to go along with the Cold War. And uh, yeah, I will I will put it on. I, I will put on this this moment in his speech where he does this this trick. And someone was talking to me about, you know, and he would make you anticipate the peas. It was like one of his oratory trademarks. But anyway, there we go. All right. So we got Earl Browder. Funny story about Earl Browder. I this is the biography of Earl Browder that I read. Where is it? Where is it? Oh my goodness. My biography of Earl Browder is not where it should be. Ah, that's because it's over here, I think. Um oh goodness gracious. Well, I don't know where my biography of Earl Browder is. I have somewhere a biography of Earl Browder. And in that biography, it talks about how he used to do this oratory trick that I just uh, I just was making fun of there. And I'll play it for you in this recording. 
And the other funny story about Earl Browder from that biography that I think is utterly hilarious is that when he was in China, uh, he was visiting an area controlled by the Red, Arm Red Army, um, and they were really honored to have him there. So they made a big sign to welcome him. True story. It's in the biography. Must be true. They made a big sign to welcome him to this area. And the sign said, China welcomes his excellency, the great Earl of Browder. I think that's hilarious. The Earl of Browder. They thought he was royalty. The Earl of Browder. But anyway, all right. So what is the time code we're going for here? All right. And I know the time code. And now I will I will import this clip. And we, we're not going to watch the whole speech, um, but we will listen to this part. Okay. I will show you. Okay. The labor movement faces great dangers. But to talk about the communists being a danger results merely in hiding the real threat. Labor is in danger of hostile legislation by the coalition of reactionaries in Congress. And labor is in danger of direct attacks by the open shop employers, by the reactionaries of big business. All right, so we'll speed ahead to... So why criticize the communists at this late date for agreeing with the majority of Americans on this point? In every important country in the world outside the United States and Britain, most Democrats cooperate with the communists as necessary to the health and progress of their countries. This unity of the people's democratic forces, including the communists, has taken place on a non-communist program proving that the communists have made the greatest concessions in the interests of unity. In France, a new constitution has been adopted and civil war avoided by the cooperation of socialists, communists, and the main body of the popular republicans. In Czechoslovakia, the majority of the country is united under a communist premier on a non-communist program. Did you hear that? Let's play that again. ...cooperation of socialists, communists, and the main body of the popular republicans. In Czechoslovakia, the majority of the country is united under a communist premier on a non-communist program. He made you wait for the P there. ...avoided by the cooperation of socialists, communists, and the main body of the popular republicans. In Czechoslovakia, the majority of the country is united under a communist premier on a non-communist non -communist program. program. So you see, on a non-communist program. He just made you wait for that P. That was apparently his trademark. In the Republicans. In Czechoslovakia, the majority of the country is united under a communist premier on a non-communist... On a non-communist... Program. Program. That's Earl Browder. Yeah, there you go. A non-communist program. So there you go. There you go. That was your... That was what you got me thinking about with your... But anyway, anyway, um, so now I'm going to start answering people's super chat questions. So the first super chat question I've got is from John McCarthy. And he's asking me about Cinco de Mayo, which is the national independence, national holiday of Mexico and its significance to the defeat of the Confederacy. And I do not know about that, um, but I'm going to Google it. Cinco de Mayo Confederacy. Right. Cinco de Mayo actually marked the defeat of the elite French forces by an undermanned Mexican army at the Battle of Puebla on May 5th, 1862. In fact, this underdog Mexican victory may have played a part in preventing French Emperor Napoleon III, Louis Bonaparte, from helping the Confederacy in the American Civil War. So there you go. There you go. Apparently... This victory by the Mexican army against the French, against Louis Bonaparte, may have prevented France from intervening on behalf of the Confederates. So now we know. Thank you, John. I had no idea about that. That was beyond my breadth of knowledge. Thank you, John. Thank you. No, that's really great. That's on Catalonia independence movement. All righty. All right. 
Um, now, the next super chat I've got here, uh, someone is asking me my thoughts about recent statements criticizing Russia's military leadership. I don't know enough about that, honestly. I, you know, I really don't know that much about it. Uh, but I will say this. Everything we are hearing about the war in American media is bullshit. All right. I mean, the numbers that they have given us are bullshit. You know, you remember what was it? The the ghost of Kiev, this this, you know, plane that was oh, it was that was bullshit. <clears throat> the casualty numbers we've been getting are bullshit. You know, they've been lying to us every military detail I hear. First of all, Russia is always about to lose, right? I mean, from the beginning, right? That's what they've been telling us. Oh, Russia's losing soldiers by the hundreds of millions. And I mean, we can't believe anything we hear. We can't believe anything we hear uh, in American media about the war. And they they take rumors and exaggerations. And I mean, there have been so many things they've told us. You know, I don't know what you're referring to there specifically, and I can't speak to it. Um, but I, I have a feeling that if American media is highlighting it and it's saying, oh, Russia's losing Russia, it's bullshit, right? They've been saying that from the beginning and it ain't true. So, you know, I have, I have a hard time, you know, I, I, I'm, I would take that with a grain of salt as they say. All right. The Epic Times has one foot in the pro Russia camp. How can they support Trump after Russia banned the Falun Gong. Well, the Epic Times, from what I can tell, as is doing everything it can to lobby Trump over their particular pet issue, which is hating China. And many people among Republicans, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, people like Tucker Carlson, are critical of the U.S. efforts in Ukraine. Um, they're more critical of China than they are of Russia. So Epic Times wants to maintain an audience among Trump supporters and among conservatives. So it makes sense that they would give view to this viewpoint and they would they would maintain that. You know, that makes sense. Right. Um, the Falun Gong is a religious group. They were in China. Interesting story. We'll talk a lot about this. This is important. In China. And this is an important point. In China, for many thousands of years, they've had, you know, what they call traditional Chinese medicine. And it's herbs and herbal remedies and, you know, bones, animal bones and different things that are done. Acupuncture, uh, different therapies, different stretching. I mean, it's just a, it's something that existed for thousands of years. Um, and you know, traditional Chinese medicine is, you know, the, the basis of it is not scientific, right? There wasn't science. They weren't going around doing science. It's based on mystical religious practices that were in China. You have to remember China never had like a central religion, right? China was not a Christian country. It wasn't a Muslim country. It wasn't a Jewish country. It wasn't a Hindu country. You know, in China, there were local customs and practices in different regions. There were different deities that people prayed to. There was different forms of ancestor worship. Buddhism had an influence. Taoism had an influence. Uh, you know, Confucianism, which is not a religion, though. Confucianism is like a theory of the state. It's a philosophy. It had a, obviously it was the most influential, you know, but there was not one central Chinese religion. So in various parts of China, you had medicinal practices that were just things people did. And Mao made a compromise with traditional Chinese medicine. There was a feeling, just like with Stalin, right? St I mean, Mao and Stalin, what you have to remember about them is they were brilliant. They were communists, but they also knew how to do it in a way that could build mass movements. They didn't push it too far. So Mao decided that they could keep traditional Chinese medicine as long as the Communist Party didn't promote any of the mystical and non-scientific religious beliefs that went with it. So people did acupuncture in the Chinese Red Army. People did, you know, these, you know, had the herbs and stuff. They just weren't doing the religious non-communist practices that went along with it. And that was the compromise that worked out pretty well. During the Cultural Revolution in China, 
they pushed traditional Chinese medicine very hard because it was not Western, because it was Chinese. Um, for example, um, you know, there's uh, if you read Edgar Snow, the last book of Edgar Snow, it was actually published after his death, it's called The Long Revolution. There's a chapter in that book called Abortion with Acupuncture. And it's about a woman who has an abortion and the only anesthesia she anesthesia she has is acupuncture and he watches it edgar snow watches her get her abortion and she's got two needles like in her neck and that cuts off her her feeling right so she doesn't feel any pain as she gets her abortion uh it's called abortion with acupuncture there was a movie that the chinese government released during the 1970s called mao cures deaf mutes and it was these children who had become deaf and mute because of uh, childhood illness. They had the measles or something like that in childhood. And with acupuncture, they were able to cure these children of being deaf or mute. And it's, it's a very, people say it's almost a religious film because like the first words these children say are long live Chairman Mao, you know, and like their families are crying because the kid learns to speak. People compare it to almost like a Christian healing video, right? Um, but it, it, you know, I mean, it was, it was at the height of the culture revolution. There was this film that they circulated called Mao cures deaf mutes. And it was all about how they used acupuncture to cure these children of deafness. And, you know, communists do things like this. I mean, Hugo Chavez had a very similar program. It wasn't Mao cures deaf mutes, but it was, it was, I believe who was the, the blind guy that Jesus cured Ananias. What was it called? It was called project and no, you know, or, um, was it Nicodemus or who was it that Jesus cured their eyesight? Jesus um, healed eyesight of blind man. Who was he? Right. Well, um, there was a blind man who Jesus cured. Um, you know, name of blind man Jesus cured. Bartima Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus, um, I believe, was it Project Bartimaeus? Is that what it was called? Project Bartimaeus. Was that it? No, Project Artemis? No, that's a space thing. All right, Hugo Chavez Eyesight Project. What was it called? Um... The New York Times has a story on it. Okay. Do they Mission Miracle, it was called? Okay. No, but there's a name. I there's a book. It was Project. It was the guy who got his eyesight cured by Jesus. What was his name? Um Eyesight Surgery. What was it called? Do, do, do. I'm trying to find the name of it, right? Free Eye Surgery Program of Hugo Chavez. Trying to find the name of it. Eye Surgery Program Hugo Chavez. Biblical name. Uh, Mission Miracle is, I'm seeing Mission Miracle, but it had a, a biblical name too. It was named after somebody who Jesus cured his eyesight. Um, what was it called? Um, can't find it. Hmm. Can't find it. Venezuela. It Operation Milagro, right? That's right. Eye surgeries, provided eye surgeries. All right. Well, I can't find the name of it. Mission Miracle is what I'm finding. But there was another name for it. It was named after Bartimaeus or something like that. 
Anyway, um, it was a program where they were giving people their eyesight, right? That millions of people throughout Latin America couldn't see because of poverty. And so they were giving laser eye surgery to people all across the thing. And so communist governments do things that are very miraculous, that are very, I mean, it's, they're not magical, but they're scientific. I mean, they, you know, they enable poor people to get their eyesight. Mao cured, you know, Mao with this, you know, this program of, uh, of, um, what do you call it? Acupuncture. They were able to cure people of their of their deafness. So traditional Chinese medicine existed, but the religion associated with it was suppressed, was not allowed. Then after the Cultural Revolution was over, when Deng Xiaoping came to power, Deng Xiaoping ended the Cultural Revolution. All of a sudden, things that were not allowed before were allowed again. And so there was like a boom of traditional Chinese medicine because all of a sudden, you know, during the Mao era, you could do it, but you couldn't do any of the religion with it. And you had to be careful how you did it, because if you were doing it in a way that was promoting religion or something that was not communist, you could get in trouble. When Deng Xiaoping came to power, there was just an explosion of traditional Chinese medicine all over the country. People were doing traditional Chinese medicine like they never had done before because it was suddenly allowed. Um, and so at that point, the Chinese Communist Party had a meeting about it. They had a meeting about it, and they ultimately decided they're against it. They just said, it's not scientific, and we're against it. Boom. They're against it. Falun Gong is led by a, a guy who I understand, if I understand correctly, he was a member of the Communist Party, if I'm not mistaken. I believe he was at one point a member of the party who was well known. He was like a guru in these traditional Chinese medicine circles. I believe I could be wrong, but um, yeah, although Falun Gong initially enjoyed support from the Chinese communist party uh, by the mid late 1990s, this is Wikipedia. It began to get negative coverage in state run media. And yeah, um, you know, it, it, Basically, it started out as something, it was a religious practice that some people in the party were promoting, and they they decided at some point, we don't believe in this, this isn't scientific, um, and because of that, the followers of Falun Gong began rebelling against the Chinese government, protesting government media outlets, etc. They had a big falling out with the Chinese government. It's a fanatical Buddhist religion. Uh, that's based, it looks like a mystical, it looks like an exercise practice. That's how it starts out. But the more you get into it, you realize it's a religion. Uh, you have a magical wheel in your stomach. Um, and if you do the right exercises, when you die, the magical wheel that has your soul in it will go to heaven. Uh, you know, um, one of their beliefs that no one ever talks about, Falun Gong, is that uh, if you are the product of an interracial marriage, you have no soul. All right? Uh, you know, you can only have a soul if your parents are of the same race. So if there's any mixed blood in you, any people of different race, you don't have a magical wheel in your stomach. You're fucked. So you can't go to heaven no matter how many magical exercises you do. You're fucked. So, uh, yeah, interracial marriage, you don't have a soul. Uh, women voting in China is a bad thing because women, uh, women having equal rights is not good, they argue. Um, you know, very anti-gay. Some of them want to publicly execute homosexuals. Some of them just want to publicly castrate homosexuals. There's a debate. Should we just castrate homosexual men or should we just kill all gay people? Uh, you know, it's a pretty right wing. Oh, well, see, there I go again. What does right wing mean, Caleb? I mean, it's a pretty traditionalist, conservative, anti-communist religion. Um and, uh, you know, uh, they had their falling out with the Chinese government. So now, um, because of that, the U.S. government loves them and they run the Epoch Times. And, you know, this is one of those immigrant constituencies. I will tell people, I remember when I first moved to New York City, you would see China Daily on the newsstands. And all of a sudden, China Daily cost 25 cents. But for free, everywhere, they had this newspaper called Epoch Times. And Epoch Times was it was just a normal newspaper, right? It was just kind of New York City news. It looked kind of liberal. They would show police brutality protests. They would show stuff like that. They kind of liked Obama. They kind of liked, you know, New York City. It was kind of a liberal paper. 
But in the back, every issue had this manifesto against the Chinese Communist Party in the back of it. It would just have like these big things claiming stuff that's been debunked so many times. They're harvesting organs. That was That's not happening. That's bullshit. The World Health Organization has done so much investigation that no, they are not harvesting their organs. That's not true. Stuff like that. It's just been debunked many, many times. Um, but then when Trump came in, at first they weren't for Trump, but after Trump made clear that being anti-China was part of the Trump agenda, at that point, all of a sudden they loved Donald Trump and, and they became a Republican paper. And now you don't see it in New York City. You don't see it in New York City because they don't like Trump here. This is a conservative, this is a liberal area. Um, but, but that's the epoch times. That's the fallen gong. Uh, that's who they are. You know, not much more to say about it. Anywho, next super chat question. Keep the super chats rolling in. The night is young. It's only 1.07 a.m., right? Um, someone said, I was in college in the 90s and you described post-war American politics precisely. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that politics is gone. And the point of my opening rant was just that that politics is gone. It's just completely gone. So if you're basing your assessment of American politics on that kind of thinking, your your way, you're lost, right? And that we have to engage with people and we have to teach them how to think. And we have to say, look, we're selling something completely new. We're, you know, we're not selling you apples. We're not selling you oranges. We're selling you bananas. And bananas are nothing like apples and oranges, that we have something completely different. That has to be our message to people. People think we sound like left People think we sound like right. They're not interested. They can get right and left from anybody. Welcome, Lori. So good to have you. Congratulations on the new podcast with Tyler. Um, you know, uh, but if people think that we're left, they think that we're right, then then we just become a stereotype. We become irrelevant and we can't teach anybody anything. And the whole point of this is to teach people something. So that was kind of the point of my opening rant tonight. David Fox says material conditions are constantly in motion. Nothing is stagnant. A does not equal A. Absolutely right. And there is no permanent politics. And we shouldn't assume that the old politics is just the way things are because it wasn't the way it was before World War II. It certainly wasn't the way it was before that. But politics is always changing. And in order to be relevant, we must be up to date. Lenin said that if the situation changes in 24 hours, the tactics must also change in 24 hours. There is no permanent tactical orientation. You have to constantly be willing to reinvent your tactics, reinvent your methods, develop new strategy in order to get things done. It's very important. Next question. What would happen to the global communist movement hypothetically if the Chinese Communist Party were overthrown? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, right? Because let me just tell you this. Let me just tell you this. 1991, the Soviet Union fell. At the time that the Soviet Union fell, most so-called communists in the world, especially in the United States, most so-called communists in the world, and in especially in the United States, I don't even know what that means. Most so-called communists in the United States said good, right? Uh, the Revolutionary Communist Party, the Maoists, they had this, this slogan, phony communism is dead, long live real communism. Uh, the, the Socialist Workers Party, the International Socialist Organization, they all said it was a great victory over Stalinism. Other than the Communist Party USA and the Workers World Party, most communists in the United States thought that the fall of the USSR was a good thing. Now, they thought it was a victory. They thought the USSR was Stalinist. They thought the USSR was not an example of what real communism was. They thought the USSR was preventing people from being interested in communism because they thought it was that evil system in the USSR. And there was just this feeling uh, among most communists in the United States that the fall of the USSR was a good thing. And there was, you know, there was the Socialist Scholars Conference that happened, you know, and, you know, I mean, Sam Marcy, Sam Marcy gave a speech to the Socialist Scholars Conference, a speech that's actually worth reading um, from April of 1990. And he's talking, he's in a room full of Trotskyites at the Socialist Scholars Conference. He's basically begging them to say, look, 
even if you don't think that the Soviet Union is socialist, right? What's happening in all these countries that were socialism is overthrown, what's happening is awful. Like people are losing their jobs and homes. It's making people poorer. We can't support this, right? And I just posted the link in the chat. It's a very good essay where he's just kind of begging all these Trotskyites at the Socialist Scholars Conference. Come on, guys, don't support the fall of the Soviet Union. Can we defend the Soviet Union, please? No, 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 they weren't listening to him. Most communists in the world, Trotskyites, Maoists, whatever, Euro-communists, they all thought the fall of the Soviet Union was a good thing. But what happened afterwards? After the fall of the Soviet Union, what happened? The global communist movement got weaker. All of those groups declined in membership. ISO declined in membership. Socialist Workers Party declined in membership. Revolutionary Communist Party declined in membership. All of these groups declined in membership. Even though they said, well, the Soviet Union is no good. This will give us a new chance. They said, oh, we'll be able to not have to be tied to the Soviet Union anymore. It'll be a great moment. Oh, it's going to be a great step forward. Without the Soviet Union, now we can have real communism. No. All of those groups lost something because when the Soviet Union was lost, something material was lost, not something ideological. That's what many people don't understand. They, they view global communism in terms of ideas. They think it's like, oh, well, the Soviet Union, the ideas they put out are not my ideas. So therefore, I should celebrate them falling. Well... If you're part of the working class movement, even if they have bad ideas, the Soviet Union existing was like, it's like having something in your camp. You had somebody on your team when the Soviet Union existed. The Soviet Union existing is why we have an eight-hour workday. The Soviet Union existing is why they had to provide union rights and decent wages. The Soviet Union existing, even if you didn't agree with it, it was like having a big thing on, on your team if you were a working class person. You had this big thing that the American government was constantly having to make the case that its system was better than what the Soviet Union had. The Soviet Union was always funding people around the world to oppose the American government. The Soviet Union was aligned with you know communist parties around the world. And so the Soviet Union existing gave us all, every working class person, a big boost. It did. Gave us all a big boost. Some weird questions I'm being asked. Gave us all a big boost. And when it was gone, everyone who was part of the working class movement, everyone who was pro-labor, everyone who was anti-war, lost something. And you can say, oh, well, I had nothing to do with the Soviet Union. They're Stalinists. I'm... Yeah, but if you're part of the labor unions, the labor movement, the labor un movement lost something. If you're against the wars, which back, back then they were, you lost something. And that's the point, right? If most so-called communists in the world today, you know, they don't like China. They denounce China. They say China's no good, blah, 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 blah. Okay. But... If these communists are part of the labor movement, China no longer existing would be a huge loss for the global labor movement. If these communists consider themselves to be anti-war, the ability of the United States to wage wars and not be afraid of China and Russia striking back or protecting would be escalated. It would be a substantial loss for everyone who's anti-imperialist or pro-working class, even if you don't think it is. Even if you denounce China, even if you, you don't associate yourself with China, when a worker's state falls, especially a massive worker's state, it is a loss for our class camp, whether we choose to admit it or not. The fall of the Soviet Union was a disaster for the global labor movement and a disaster for the global anti-imperialist movement. And when it really gets down to it, the global anti-imperialist movement and the global labor movement is where communism is at. Communism is the vanguard of both of those movements. That's what it is. No, it's not a, a, a look 
No, it's not a, a brand you buy on the internet. Communism is the global struggle of the working class for control of the means of production, and it is the global struggle of the colonized people against foreign domination and against the global system of monopoly capitalism and the big monopolies. And if you are a communist who is at all relevant, you are part of the global struggle of the working class, the labor movement, and you're part of the anti-imperialist movement. So if you're part of the global anti-imperialist movement, and if you're part of the labor movement, which any communist who's doing anything of relevance is, I mean, you can call yourself a communist and just be on the internet and not be. But if, if you are part of the global anti-imperialist movement, if you're part of the global labor movement, if China were to fall, that would be a loss for you. It's just that simple. And you can, you can pretend it's not all you want. You can pretend it's not all you want, but at the end of the day, it is, right? China is a friend of American labor, and China is a friend of the global anti-imperialist movement. China's existence prevents wars. China's existence causes U.S. workers to increase their living standards. And China being gone, if the Chinese Communist Party were out of power, our living standards would drop, and austerity would march ahead, number one. And number two, the ability of the United States to wage ruthless regime change wars around the world would be increased. So, yeah, it's a material. Socialist countries existing, it's like having something solid in your camp, right? It, it's not about what they believe, you know? I mean, and that's what you need to understand. And that's, that's actually the point that Sam Marcy was making when he addressed the Socialist Scholars Conference in 1990. All these people were there celebrating the overthrow of socialism throughout the Eastern Bloc, and they just didn't understand it. I'm posting that in the link because it's an important presentation. All right, uh, next question. Thoughts on Catalonia independence movement? I don't know enough about the specifics of, of Spanish politics and Catalonia. I, I don't know enough about the specifics of it. I My bias is towards supporting any separatist movement in a Western capitalist country, um, which Spain is. Uh, but that said, I mean, I've heard different things. I'm not in Spain and I, I don't take a solid position on that issue. Um, but, you know, my my gut is to support it just because we want to break apart any Western capitalist imperialist country and we support oppressed nationalities within the imperialist centers. Um, but I've heard I've heard different things about it. Right. And I, I mean, Scottish independence, I thought was a good movement, but then it clearly deteriorated into something bad. I mean, at this point, Scottish independence has really taken an awful turn. It's the synthetic left at this point. I thought Scottish independence, you know, was when it was an anti-austerity movement. I liked Tommy Sheridan and I like when it was being framed as a struggle against austerity and a struggle against new labor. And I, I really liked Scottish independence, but then Scottish independence deteriorated into what it is now, which is wokeism. It's just toxic wokeism with Scottish characteristics. And so I don't support it no more, right? And so I was wrong about that, right? So it's possible Catalan independence could be of a similar variety. I don't know. Um, my instinct is always to support any nationality in an imperialist homeland that wants to break away. That is my instinct. But, you know, there are, you know, there are situations. It depends on the dynamics of the politics. All right. Will a genderless society ever be achieved? What does that mean? What does that mean, right? I mean, obviously, biological sex is always going to exist. Now, gender is understood as the social interpretation of biological sex. And the nature of gender is always changing and evolving. In different societies, at different times, we have different attitudes about what a man is and what a woman is, right? The way a woman is supposed to act, you know, women smoking cigarettes, that used to not be a thing. You know, then thanks to what's his name, the marketing guy, I can't even remember his name. Uh, what is his name? Lanaise or, you know, now women smoke cigarettes, right? I mean, you know, gender roles have changed as society has evolved. That has That is true. Uh, will there always be some gender roles to some degree? Sure, I think there will be, but our attitudes about it will change. I expect that will probably loosen, um, you know, to some degree. I think there'll be more, you know, women 
women will have more freedom to be boxers or basketball players or, or soldiers. Men will have more freedom to work in the fashion industry or be hairstylists, you know, but to some degree or other, but Bernays, Bernays. Yeah. Uh, Ed Bernays, but to some degree or other, to some degree or other, there's going to be expectations about gender. I think they will change. There will be different expectations related to gender as society changes, as the economic base and the superstructure changes. But I think there will always, to some degree or other, be an expectation of human beings based on their gender. I think that that exists. So to say genderless society, you know, there will, a genderless society would mean there is no link between one's biological sex and society's expectations of them. That's, that's I don't think that'll ever happen. Um, I think things will be loosened. Uh, probably, and things may, who knows, things could tighten up at some point, right? You know, but uh, to think that they will, that we'll get to a point where there is no, there's no link. Society's expectations of people has nothing to do with their biological sex. I don't think that'll ever happen. Just don't think it'll happen. I mean, I, I just, you know, I think that to some degree or other, society will always have some expectation of people on the basis of their biological sex, regardless of how rigidly it's enforced. I think we're becoming much more tolerant of people, um, people, you know, being gender non-conforming, which is good. But at the same time, there you go. Um, you know, if you took off Marcy's name and tried to <laughs> with that speech, they'd have a security toss you out for being a Nazbol. Yeah, it's wild. It's really, really wild. You know, it's really, really wild. But yeah, I mean, it's wild times. I mean, PSL, to some degree, tries to tell people the USSR was a good thing. That the overthrow of the USSR was a bad thing. I mean, they they, they more or less probably agree with the message still. Um, you know, um, but you know, most of them, they don't care about that. They just care about woke shit. You know, that's where PSL is at. What they care about is protesting against Donald Trump for being a big fat racist. What they care about, you know, is the latest trendy hipster liberal cause they saw on CNN. And they think their way of being political is like subtle, doing the woke thing and then subtly inserting like pro Cuba talking points into it. That's the revolution as far as they're concerned. They don't understand that's called tailism. Right. And they also don't understand that woke people are the last people that are going to lead a revolution in America. That, you know, if Mao Zedong were living in America, where would he be? He would be in the poorest part of Appalachia. Say it with me. Forming a George Washington Bible gun club. That's like a mantra. It's like one of our new CPI mantras. Right. I was told that years ago. And it's true. Right. That this idea that the woke people are are. They're, you know, when Mao says the masses are the water and the revolutionary is the fish, the woke people ain't the water. Let me just put it that way. The woke people ain't the water. You can quote me on that. The woke people ain't the water. When Mao says the masses are the revolutionaries or the masses are the, are the water and the revolutionaries are the fish, the woke people ain't the water. That's Caleb Bompin. You can quote me. I sound like I'm from Ohio. The woke people, the wokes ain't water. Wokes ain't water. There you go. Well, make it more concise. Wokes ain't water. Um, there you go. Um, next question. Subway execution by a Marine. I don't, what is that? Subway execution by a Marine. I don't even know what that is. So, Oh, this is the horrendous racist incident that happened. The people are protesting. I'm going to hold off commenting on that right now. Obviously, we oppose all racism here. You know, Jordan Neely, chokehold death calls grow louder. New York City subway rider accused in chokehold death of a homeless man. U.S. Marine. Okay, well, you know, this is one of those cases Right. I saw about this on the news. And this is one of those cases where we have to investigate the facts. Right. And, you know, I mean, with Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, 
with Kyle Rittenhouse. I heard when I first heard about Kyle Rittenhouse, I was like, fuck that guy. Right. Right wing kid goes to a protest with his gun. Fuck him. Right. You know, I wanted him buried under the jail. I was like, fuck him. But then I started hearing that, oh, wow, he didn't kill black people. I was like, wait, wait, I thought he killed black people. That's the whole point. He was a right wing dude, went to a protest, shot some black people. No, he actually killed a convicted pedophile who was white. And I'm like, huh? Okay. And the person trying to kill him also had a gun. And I'm like, wait a second. And at that point, and I, I, I mean, I know, you know, uh, Fiorella from Convo Cow, she said that she felt that he should have gotten manslaughter charges rather than murder, right? Uh, other people felt he was completely innocent. But I just knew once I learned that it was not black people he killed, number one, and number two, the people he killed had a gun. And he was like, at that point, I was like, okay, I'm going to shut up about this case. And a lot of people really wanted me to comment on it. And I was like, nope, I'm shutting up about it. Um, you know, and, and then when I saw that that's what communist groups were all fired up about, I'm like, wait a second, guys. I get it. I know why you're fired up about it. Cause CNN is fired up about it. That's why you're fired up about it. Right. And I mean, this case, I haven't looked into the details. It could be, this is a racist hate crime. And if it is, I'm against it. 100%, you know, um, you know, I am against racism. I am against hate crimes and, you know, absolutely. But I don't know the details of this case and I'm not ready to jump on the bandwagon. I'm not, I'm just not ready to jump on the bandwagon. I have to do some research. I have to look into the case before I run off and decide, you know, decide let's, let's come on, let's get, let's get this shit out of here. <sighs> you know, you know, um, but you know, before I decide what I'm saying, right. You know, I see someone in the chat is saying, why does skin color matter? Well, it matters, you know, unfortunately in cases like this, there was a very famous case in New York city, Bernard gets right. He was a subway vigilante. Right. He carried a gun with him on the subway. Um, you know, like three young men walked up to him and they were asking him for money. He claimed they were trying to rob him. They said he was just, you know, asking them for money or whatever. But he pulled his gun out and he said, sure, I've got five dollars for each of you when he shot them all. Um, you know, and he became this hero to the right wing. Well, you know, just because people come up to you and ask you for money, they don't have the right to kill them. Right. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, it was racial. It was absolutely racial. This guy was white. These three young men who came up to him were black. Is it possible they were trying to rob him? Maybe, but he didn't have the right to kill them. You know, he should have, you know, I mean, if he was a legal gun owner, he could have pulled out his firearm and said, don't rob me. And they would have backed away, you know, um, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, and and it was racial, right? So, you know, and I don't know. I mean, race does have an, a factor here. I haven't read the facts of this case. I haven't read the facts of this case. I will say the subways lately have been very scary. You know, I used to ride the subways all the time. In New York City, I would ride the subway to work every day. It was fine. Since the pandemic, things have gotten very scary on the subways. I mean, you know, they have gotten very scary on the subways and, you know, you get nervous on the subways, you know, I, I'm not going to say anything further. I'm not going to say anything further because I don't want to say anything that'll be taken out of context. And, you know, if this young man was choked to death and didn't do anything wrong and some guy with PTSD just grabbed him, that's horrible. And that guy who grabbed him should be prosecuted for being a violent criminal. Um, but I want to look at the details first and I don't trust the left. I'm at the point five years ago, I would have just immediately jumped on the bandwagon about this case, but I am so, I have been so badly burned by the left at this point. I, I want to do my own investigation first. You know, I, I, I just have to do my own investigation first because the left has just burned me so bad. Right. I mean, you know, I know that I am not a Nazi. I hate Hitler. I don't deny the Holocaust. The Holocaust is a 100% historical fact. 
I don't believe in racial pseudoscience. You know, I'm not a Nazi, but according to thousands of people, I'm a Nazi. Why? Just because. Just because. I, I, you know, and it's just a fact. You know, Caleb's a Nazi. And a pedophile rapist. I'm a Nazi pedophile rapist. Why? Because he is. Because they heard. Because, and you can't argue with these people. If you show these people my record, the fact that I was arrested, you know, that I video recorded the police brutalizing black women and got them acquitted in court with my video and was known in Cleveland for my anti-police brutality activism before Black Lives Matter was ever tweeted. No. No, no, there's got to be some way Caleb's still, you know, I mean, these facts just don't matter, right? And so, you know, I'm not a Nazi. Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, the details about that case we were lied to about doesn't mean he was a good guy, right? Not endorsing him. I mean, the fact that he got his gun and went to the protest makes him an asshole in my view, but doesn't make him a murderer and the details of how the shooting happened is horrifying and the people making him a hero are disgusting, but I was lied to about Kyle Rittenhouse. So, you know, I mean, I've been smeared. I've been lied about. I've had my reputation run through the mud by some very evil people. And so, I mean, I don't know the details about this case. I saw the protests happening on TV. I saw the PSL was out there protesting. And look, I don't think we should just chase and tail after whatever's trendy on CNN. That's not what being a leftist is about. Do you ride the NYC subway? Of course I do. All the time. Whenever I go to Manhattan, I ride the NYC subway. Yes, I ride the NYC subway frequently. I used to ride it every day, but now I work from home, so I don't ride it every day. But I ride it when I go to church on Sunday. I go to church in Manhattan, and I ride it to church every Sunday. And I, I ride it into Manhattan when I'm meeting a cameraman to film. And I ride it when I'm going to events in Manhattan. And I ride it, you know, I ride it a lot. Not every day. It used to be every day I woke up, got on the subway. Not no more because I work from home because the RT studio closed down. So, you know, and I will say, you know, first there was the lockdowns. For a while, we still had our RT studio before the Ukraine thing got, got going. Um, and uh, after the lockdowns were over, the subways were very different. They were very different. Um, and it's, it's scary. And, you know, if I go into detail about how it's scary, someone's going to interpret that and, you know, take it out of context or say, I'm justifying what this guy did. Cause I mean, look on the surface, it looks like this guy did a horrendous thing. It looks like this guy murdered an innocent black youth, you know, however, I am going to investigate and make sure that that's the case before I comment on it. If I just look at, on the surface, it looks like this black youth was murdered in a chokehold, and that's wrong. But I'm going to look for the details first. I'm going to look into it, listen to what people have to say. Um, so there you go. I mean, I mean, and I, I'm sorry if there's anyone who's triggered or disappointed by this, but I have just been, I have seen the left lie so much, and I have been smeared by the left so much. And I've, and, you know, crime has very much increased in this city. I'll tell you that much. Since the pandemic, crime has really shot up in this city. Um, the city isn't what it was. And, you know, I don't know, like, one thing I've seen a, a lot more of, and this is just really sad, since the pandemic is mentally ill people. You know, and mentally ill people don't belong in jail. They belong, you know, they, they deserve treatment. That's what they deserve. They deserve to get the help they need. But since the pandemic, there's been a lot of mentally ill people in New York City. A lot more. There's always been crazy people. This is New York City. But there was a lot more crazy people since the pandemic. And a lot of the crazy people are not fun to be around. Let me just put it that way. They want to have a fight with you. You know, um... Right. You have to just keep walking. I mean, 
you know, there have been so many times I have been walking, you know, from the subway to where I'm going. And one of these crazy people intentionally bumps into me. They go out of their way to bump into me and then try to have a fight with me. And I just keep going. I just keep going. And then I'm fine. But they will, I, and I'll see them. I, they, they will see someone coming and they, they want to have a fist fight. I, it, it, it's a certain mental illness. I don't know what is wrong with them. And they, it's not, they're not singling me out. They're trying with everyone they can. I, I, men, women, I do not know why they do it. I do not know why they do it. And it's, it's a dangerous form of mental illness. It's frightening. But you'll be walking from the subway and it's a person who looks like kind of homeless or off will, will kind of bump into you and go, Hey, you bumped into me. Huh? And, and they want to have a fight with you. And you just have to keep going. And they're not going to follow you. They're not going to follow you. So you just keep going. Um, and so you do, right? And luck, but think about it, right? I mean, somebody, somebody, if you don't know what you're doing, right? You could walk past the subway and they go out of their way to bump into you. And then they get angry with you and want to fight with you. And if somebody doesn't know what they're doing, maybe someone's been in prison where you can't keep walking or somebody has been in another situation that could escalate to a point. You could go to jail. Someone could go to jail. You know, that's not somebody who's doing that needs help, right? If someone's out on the street trying to fight with somebody, I don't know why. Maybe they, they have a lot of aggression. They need to get out or they've got mental illness or whatever. That's scary. It's not pleasant to be in a situation where you've got people and you can see them and they're doing it with every person who goes by every single one. It's not, it's not specific to you. They, they want the attention of getting into a fight. They want to get their aggression out. They want, I don't know what they want, but I've seen that behavior from homeless people. That's scary. Okay. That's very scary. Right. Um, you know, they want to feel I don't know what they want, but they want to get into a fight. That's terrifying, right? Um, you know, um, I don't know. I, I, you know, there's there's things like that that happen, and that's not pleasant, you know. Um, you know, obviously people get robbed. That happens. People get their homes broken into. You have some interesting questions. What's the message behind Forrest Gump? I don't know. That's the '90s movie. It's a 90s movie. Um, uh, if you've ever seen Forrest Gump, it stars Tom Hanks. It's about a, a mentally disabled man uh, who kind of accidentally gets himself into a lot of, you know, a lot of historic events, right? Um, and it's supposed to be like a, a nostalgia through the decades movie. It's about post-World War II America, the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War movement. I think at the end it talks about the AIDS crisis. It's about America from the 50s to the early 80s, you know, and it's like a nostalgia movie, a nostalgic movie with this very psychologically disabled guy kind of bumbling through America, right? That's kind of what it is. It's, it's a nostalgic movie. Um, what I will say about that movie um, is that, uh, you know, that movie is very the way it portrays the anti-Vietnam War protest movement is wildly inaccurate, right? But it fits this kind of myth that the protesters were all spitting on soldiers and called baby killers. And, you know, the Black Panthers just hated white people and stuff. Um, but I think this guy, Bad Empanada, has learned his politics from that movie because that's what he does. He goes around and calls anyone who serves in the military awful names, which is just like ridiculous, right? I mean, I've spent my whole adult life trying to explain to people, no, socialists, we don't spit on soldiers. No, socialists don't hate the military. We're against the wars. No, we're not against our troops, you know? And then, you know, and they got people like Bad Empanado. It's like they got their politics from, from, I missed a super chat. Uh, oh, best format for non-DNC sanctioned 2024 debates. You know, I mean, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, it's it's decades nostalgia. It's through the decades nostalgia. Um, you know, it's kind of about loneliness. I think it's about looking for meaning. 
Um, it's also kind of about adventure, right? It's like, he's like, what is it? He says, life is like a box of chocolates, right? It's just a classic American movie. Um, it's sad. It's pretty sad at some parts. Pretty tragic about the sad realities of American life. Can be, kind of be about how people's intentions matter. I think you can see it that way. The point is that Forrest Gump is not the smartest guy in the world, but he means well, right? That's kind of the point. He means well. He's a well-intentioned person who's not, not very smart, but he means well. And I think the message is if you mean well, you'll get far in America. I mean, it's about the American dream. He becomes rich. He starts Apple or something. I, You know, it's, it's supposed to sell the idea that in America, a very, very dumb person can become a celebrity. A very, very dumb person can become very wealthy. I think that's the idea. That's the idea. That's the idea. All righty. So what is the best format for a non-sanctioned debate of the DNC? Well, one of the networks should just, should just do it. All right? Fox, Fox News should just do it. Or MSNBC should just do it, but they won't right? I mean, there's a chance Fox might do it just because they want the ratings. But then again, Fox seems to be more tightly controlled now they got rid of Tucker. So I don't know. I mean, one of the networks just needs to call it and say, you know, we're having a debate anyway. And if Biden doesn't show, that's on him. All right. One of the networks or one of the networks or a popular YouTube channel or somebody, somebody who wants to make a lot of money and doesn't give a rat's ass about pleasing you know, the establishment should just say, well, they're not having an official debate. Marion Williamson, RFK, Joe Biden, if you want, you can come and join us. We're doing a debate on here. Somebody who could get the two to agree, they should do it, right? And if Marion Williamson and RFK, RFK would do it, I'm sure. Marion Williamson, eh, you know, but uh, Biden, would Biden show up? Maybe not, but um, but yes, you know, somebody, somebody should do have a non-sanctioned DNC debate. Um, I think that would be a great thing to do. Absolutely. I think it'd be a fine, that would be a fine, fine thing for someone to do. Have a debate with RFK and Marion Williamson. And there probably will be some, but it'll get ignored by mainstream media. I mean, I, I think American politics at this point is completely, it's completely rigged. I have never seen anything like this, right? Joe Biden is unpopular as a president. Kamala Harris is even less popular as a president but they're running for re-election, even though the bulk of their own party doesn't want them to. And there's going to be no debates. No debates. No debates. And Donald Trump is also running for president, but he's indicted. And it looks to me like even though Donald Trump would probably win, enough of the security state, enough of his own party are against him they will, they, there has been an, a meeting. There has been a decision that Trump will not be allowed to be president again by the power structure. They're just not going to let it happen because of January 6th, because of all of that, they're just not going to let him be, be president again. So based on the fact that the Democrats are, you know, they're pretty sure that they've got a situation here where Trump will never be allowed to be president. And because of that, because of that, um, they're basically banking on, well, we got this. We got this one. You know, you know, they're basically saying, you know, hey, we might lose the match, but we kind of got an assurance that the other side isn't going to show up. So, yeah. And. I mean, this is, it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Ice Cube should organize a debate. The rapper, is he a rapper? Ice Cube? Is, is Ice Cube a rapper? I thought Ice Cube was a rapper. Is Ice Cube a rapper? Gavin would know that. Gavin is our resident rap expert. Um, is Ice Cube, Ice Cube is a rapper, right? I don't know. I don't know about, about, you know, all that hip music the kids are listening to these days. Jenny Lynn says, yes, yes, he's a rapper. Is that one of the, is that, is that a new CD that kids are listening to? Is that an eight track? Is that like when kids are going out and buying record players and they, they play them backwards? I'm just, I'm just joking. All right. Um, 
And John McCarthy says, yes. All right. He was an NWA. I do know NWA. All righty. Ice, ice, baby. That, that's vanilla ice. That's different. I know, I know ice, ice, baby. That's vanilla ice. That's completely, completely different, Barry. Don't, don't throw me a wild card like that, Barry. I don't appreciate that. Very funny. Very funny, Barry. You tried to get me to say Ice Cube was ice, ice, baby. He is not that. No, he ain't. 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 Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the notifications bell. It is almost two in the morning, and it's Friday night, and I'm here in my lovely Brooklyn apartment talking to all of you about politics. Tomorrow night, I'm going to a quinceanera with my wife, and it should be fun because they always have good food and dancing at quinceaneras, right? Quinceañeras. Uh, funny, funny that I'm a white supremacist who married a Latino and goes to quinceañeras. I don't know how many white supremacists go to quinceañeras, but do facts matter? No. No, they don't. But anyway, yeah, I'm going to a quinceañera tomorrow with my wife. I was planning to go to the Spartacist meeting. I was going to go see the Spartacist League. They're having their first public event ever in a long time. I was going to go, but it looks like I can't go to that because I'm going to a quinceañera. So I'm going to a quinceanera and um, going to the quinceanera tomorrow. Might stream on Sunday. We shall see. I'll be back on here. You know, that's working from home. I get up. I do my job. I go to the gym and I exercise. I read books. I eat in restaurants. You know, I go to the gym. Today I went to the gym. I did the thing where I put my arms up in the air this Today, I did it for about 11 minutes, right? Sometimes I can do 14 minutes. That day when I did the full 20 minutes, that was very rare. That was very, very, very rare. I usually, I can rarely do that. Rarely, rarely can I do that. But I, I always start out my exercise. I put on the John Philip Sousa music and I put my arms up in the air and I hold them up in the air as long as I possibly can. And people say, oh, Caleb, why don't you just do push-ups? Push-ups don't help your posture. And in fact, I tend to curl when I do push-ups, so it doesn't help my posture. But I start out my exercise with my arms in the air. Uh, you know, usually I can go over 10 minutes. On a good day, I can do 14. Um, but, you know, there was that one rare day, and I told you about it immediately on here. I was blown away. I did like 21 minutes. I was like, is I don't know where that came from. I haven't been able to do that since. But I'll tell you, after I do that thing with my arms in my air, I just, oh, my shoulders and, oh, it feels so good. My my whole upper body feels alive, feels very, very alive when I do that, right? I mean, it's like holding up, you know, sure, for the first minute, two minutes, it doesn't feel that bad. But after a while, you know, you're just up there and you're just like, you want to put your arms down. And I always remind myself, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. And I try to keep my arms up in the air as long as I possibly can. I got the John Philip Sousa music playing in my head. You know, and I know the music, right? And so as I'm getting along, I'm thinking I'm going further. I'm going further. And uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. And then after that, I hit the elliptical machine. I usually try to go for an hour if I can. Sometimes only a half an hour, depending on how much energy I have. That is how I, that is my gym routine that I do, right? And that's my gym routine. I try to go four days a week if I can, maybe five days a week, maybe three days a week. I try to do try to do that. Um, try to work up a sweat, take a nice shower afterwards. You know, that's my exercising routine. I may be trying to put it up a notch because, you know, I do, you know, I, I feel like I could do, I could get more out of it. So I'm, I may be, you know, taking it up a notch, but it's kind of basic for me. I'm not a very physically fit person. I'm just not right. I'm not an exercise oriented guy. Right. Um, but you have to, I have to, because I'm going to go crazy. If I don't, I'm working from home. It's like, I wouldn't go anywhere. I wouldn't do anything. Right. And so I'm, I might be taking the exercise up a notch. We shall see. Um, you know, it really improves the mood. I will say that there's some days where I'm just feeling tired and bored and nervous and I go and exercise and I feel better though. Sometimes, sometimes I'm in kind of a lazy mood and I go exercise and then I get angry. That doesn't help. Right. You don't want to feel angry. Anger is not a positive emotion generally. Um, but I'm, I'm working on it. You know, the exercise is, is a good thing. It certainly made me a happier person. If you want to make yourself go exercise, right. 
A lot of people have trouble making themselves exercise. For me, the, what gets me there is knowing that I will feel better afterwards. It will improve my mood. If I can sweat, get some energy out, I will feel better. My mood will improve, right? And that is like the immediate payout, right? You think long-term, I might lose weight. Long-term, I might get better muscles or whatever. Yeah, that comes in the long-term. But for me, the immediate payout is... You know, it gets my body going again, right? You know, and it's and it's kind of a cold day. Your body just wants to get lazy and tired. Go exercise. It jolts you right awake. Jolts your body into awake mode, and then you can go, go, go. Yeah. So you know, I'm not, I'm not a, I, I shouldn't be giving fitness advice on here. I'm the last person who should ever give any fitness advice because I am not a physically fit person. I'm not athletic in any conceivable way. My only athletic, the only time in my life I would call myself athletic was that when I was in junior high school, I used to run cross country. I don't know. I told this story on here before, but it bears repeating, right? Right. You all are here and we, we talk about all kinds of things. I remember when I was in junior high, I ran cross country. When I was in junior high, we ran two mile races, cross country running. And I did that in junior high. My coach was Coach Radford. Uh, coach Radford was my coach, and I was in the junior high cross country team. I was not the best cross country runner, but I was okay. I could do it. Um, and I remember that I have always had a high level of endurance, um, and that was what I would do. I I remember I would run cross country. It's a two mile race and you're running through the woods and over the bridge and you know around the, the football field and you're running. It's a two mile race, right? So I'd be running, 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 and I would see the end of the race. And that was always it for me. So I wanted a course where I could see the end sooner, right? Because as soon as I saw the end of the race, I could go in my head, okay, I only have to get that far. So I am going to give it everything I got, everything I got for that last end of the race. And so I would see the end of the race ahead of me. And all of a sudden I would just think, Argh! and I would just give it everything I had for the end of the race. And like all the moisture in my body would go up into my chest and I would just be, Argh! you know, I would just give it everything I had for that last kick at the end of the race. And I would usually pass like six or seven people at the end of the race because I still had it. And I would usually vomit at the end of the race. True story. I get to the end of the race and then I would vomit. But I had the ability to give it everything I had for that last bit, that last bit. Um, you know, which it, that's just how I am. I don't know what it is, but for some reason, the endurance of pain is something I'm good at, right? As long as I can pace myself, as long as I can go, okay, I've only got this far to go. Boom. I can do it. Um, you know, um, which not everyone has that ability, right? For, that's just how part of, part of living life is knowing your body well. Right. Um, and for me, that's one thing, like, for example, when I was a kid, Phys ed class, physical education you used to always have the flex. We, we used to do pull ups. I could never do a pull up. I, I just don't didn't have the upper body strength. But we did this other thing in the presidential fitness test that was called the flexed arm hang. And it was like a pull up. You got into pull up position and you held it for as long as you could. You didn't have to actually pull yourself up because I could never do that. But you held the position. You went like this. And you held yourself in pull-up position. I actually remember I did that in junior high. I was third place in my entire class. My class of 30 people, I was third. And I'm like, how is this possible? Like half the class, half the boys in the class can do a pull-up. I can't do one. But yet I'm able to flex the arm hang longer than them. Why is that? Endurance. That's what it is, right? I have the ability to endure pain. I don't know why. I don't know why you can get all psychological about it. It's probably just biological, right? My body is different than other people's bodies. For some reason, brrr, I could flex arm hang longer than anybody else. Just like I could do the kick at the end of the cross country race. That's just how my body is. People, you know, 
we all assume everyone's just like us, but when it comes to things like pain, when it comes to things like physical endurance, when it comes to things like colors, everybody's different, right? The way you see blue may not be the same way someone else sees blue. Think about it. I mean, you know, the way you experience pain is not the same way someone else experienced pain, right? The way you breathe, I mean, everyone's experience is different. There's a wide variety of human experience. And it's a mistake to assume, we all just assume everyone is like us. And we are similar in a lot of ways, to be fair. There are a lot of people who are like us. There are a lot of people who just aren't. You know, I mean, and that's one thing I've learned just, just meeting people on these live streams. The kind of people who like these live streams, there's something, there's some commonality there. And it's actually quite interesting. I, I've often wondered what it is about these live streams that kind of, you know, but, but everyone who's part of this community, we, we, there are things, there's, it, it's weird. Right. When I get to know people that are part of this community, it's like you were one of the people who could do the flex arm hang too, or not. Maybe you weren't, but there's weird like overlap in our personalities and our life histories. It's actually kind of interesting. I have a lot more in common when I meet people from this community, people that end up joining the CPI, becoming part of this. I realize I have a lot more in common with them than just an interest in the politics that we do here. We are, if you're part of this community, you're really in this community, this community really speaks to you. There's a connection that's much deeper than just an interest in communism, an interest in world events, anti-imperialism, anti-status quo, interest in the concepts in, in the new book. There's more to that. We've got something deeper going on here. I'm not quite sure what it is. Sometimes it makes me a little nervous, to be honest. I met people that are part of this community and I'm like, oh, you do this too? Oh, you do this too? Oh, you do this too? And it makes me nervous, honestly, right? Um, Thelonious Punk says, super cool family. There's people on, there's people that, that are part of this community. I'm not going to get too specific here. Who, who knew things about me that I'd never shared on these streams and told them to me. And I'm just like, how did you know this about me? And they're like, cause I'm like that too. And I'm just like, damn, damn, you know, it, it's weird, right? That, that, you know, some people find me to be really annoying. Okay. Some people find me to be really annoying. Okay. And those people are not watching right now. And if you are one of the people who's watching right now and you think I'm really annoying, I pity you. I mean, yeah, there's the anti-fans, which that is a, a layer of mental illness we'll talk about another night. Anti-fans are a special kind of crazy, right? Because it's like you're torturing yourself. That's all you're doing if you're an anti-fan, right? I mean, you know, I mean, the bread tube. I wrote a whole book about bread tube, but I didn't watch hours and hours of bread tube before I wrote it. You know what I mean? I just kind of watched so I could get the basic concepts. You know, I didn't, you know, I mean, I mean, if, if I like did nothing but watch Vosh and sit there and hate wash him all day, I would kill myself. I mean, it would just be so awful. But there's people who do this. There's probably people watching right now that are hate watchers. Aside from the hate watchers, if you're one of the people who finds me to be really obnoxious, you're probably not watching right now. But for those of you who like what we do here, who find what we do here to be very special, we are connected on a very deep level. And it's fascinating to me when I meet people that are part of this community, when I sit across from you and have lunch or dinner, when you open up and sometimes people tell me things and I'm like, Ooh, are you sure you want to tell me that? And they're like, of course I'm going to tell you that Caleb, you're in my living room. I'm like, Oh, okay. You're, you're you know, you're part of my life. I'll tell you that. I'm like, okay. You know, you can open up to me. People open up to me and I, I'm like, damn. And they and it, it, it's weird. We have something really special going on here, but it's, it's much deeper than politics. It's much deeper than politics. And it kind of scares me sometimes. I'll be honest with you because I don't like the level of depth. The level of similarity and connection over things that we don't talk about on these streams is big. So, you know, hey, 
what the heck? You know what I mean? Um, you know, I'm really, I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that I love you all. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not, I'm, I'm doing it in this roundabout confused way where I'm trying to be like, I'm scared of it. It scares me. I, I love you all. Let me just put it that way. If you're still here at this point, Oh boy. If you, if you're still here at this point, that means you and I have something in common because they have done everything they can to get you out of here. Right. They have, Oh my God, they have run my name through the mud and they've punched and they've, they've, they've like, they have, they've taken our community and they've just like stomped on it. And they're just like, God damn, will you let it die? I'll let it die. And you know, and, and it's just, we're still here. So if you're still here now, I love you. I love you. I seriously love you because that means there's something special here and there's something unbreakable here. I mean, it's like, you know, cause you know, what we got to do is we got to figure out how to make more people part of this. We got to get more people to understand how special what we're doing here is. And we got to make use of this bond. We got to make this bond that we have here mean something more than just, we all have a great place to hang out on Saturday morning at 2 AM. Right. We got to, we got to build, you know, we got to utilize, I almost said weaponize, but we got to utilize our community power. That's what we got to do. So that's what I'm trying to say here. All is that I love you all very, very deeply. It's very, very special to me what goes on here. I know it's special to you as well. And, you know, thanks for all the great super chat questions. Thanks for giving me somebody to talk to here late at night. This is a community, as Lori is saying. Um, all you need is love, truly. Um, so I guess I'll do our closing mantra. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared. Revolution is the main trend in the world today. Good night.